Uh, yeah. Thanks everyone for coming. I think uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone. Uh, welcome to our bookstore. I'm Michael, event host at RJ Julia. We're joined tonight by two wonderful uh, chefs, writers, restaurateurs, advocates, ag activists, and a number of uh, roles in each of each of these uh, individuals' play. We have Jason Hamill and Michelle Nisham. We'll be talking about Jason Hamill's new release, the Lula Cafe Cookbook. I see that a number of you already have it in your hands. Uh, Jacques Pepin was just admiring it also. But uh, so Jason is in conversation tonight with Chef Michel Michon, who has a variety of projects of his own. We'll hear from our guests about the book and hopefully much more about themselves, what they're cooking, as well as what they're working on now and, and what's coming up next. Jason will be signing copies of the book immediately after the event, just in the, uh, the room that most of you came from there. Uh, there's a, a desk there. Um, if you haven't already had a chance to purchase your copy, you can do so at this register or at the register next door. The Lula, I'm going to try to keep this short because uh, we're here to see okay. these two. But uh, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> the Lula Cafe Cookbook is a story of 20 years of cooking, love, friendship, and community told through food, with each recipe taking a particular moment in time as its inspiration. With 90 recipes and fantastic photography, uh, I just overheard an interesting story behind the photography. Hopefully you'll you'll share with us. This book gives a behind the scenes look into the food and story of this iconic Chicago restaurant. A few highlights about uh, Jason. Jason Hamill's the uh, executive chef and owner of Lula Cafe, which opened in Chicago's Logan Square in 1999. I think a lot of you probably already know a lot of this information, but uh, uh, he grew up in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, Hamill was originally aspired to be a writer. Uh, after graduating uh, with a degree in English, he traveled to Italy for an accidental stay. This is from the bio. You might have more yeah, details to, yeah. to add here, but uh, so far, so an accidental yeah. stay Historically accurate. across the street from Florence's Central Market uh, gave him some inspiration and uh, 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 foreshadowing of his career as a chef. Uh, his restaurants have been featured in the press, including NPR, This American Life. Uh, he's also a mentor for cooks in the Midwest and founded the nonprofit food education program, Pilot Light. Michelle Nisham is a four-time James Beard award-winning chef with 40 years of leadership, advocating for a more healthful, sustainable food system. He's co-founder and executive chairman of Wholesome Wave, uh, Wholesome Crave, and founder and partner with the late actor Paul Newman of the former dressing, uh, dressing room restaurant. Uh, Nishan has led a lifelong career championing the farm to table movement decades before it had a name. He's also the author of three cookbooks that celebrate sustainable food systems. So, uh, here to tell us more about the cooking, about the book, and hopefully about themselves, uh, Michelle and uh, and Jason. Thank you. <laughs> right. How many people have eaten that Lula? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Delicious, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I've been blessed to eat there just uh, recently. Yeah, just recently, you know, but but a few times. Uh, anybody who like opens for brunch or dinner is a hero of mine because it, it, it gives you that opportunity to really understand um, the importance of food at every waking moment of somebody's life, right? And some people are like, I'm I'm only a savory chef. I'm only a pastry chef. I'm only a breakfast. I'm only a. But these guys kind of tackle it all. So I just want to congratulate you for that because all of it from from beginning to end has has always been exceptional. But it's what what I'm curious about is what culinary school have you go to? <laughs> um, I, well, I mean, I kind of went to the cookbook culinary school. Uh, <laughs> I, no, I did not go to culinary school, but I did uh, study. You did not go to culinary school. I did not, but I studied hard uh, after I already owned a restaurant. So I, I did it backwards. I opened a restaurant and then realized that I needed to really learn how to cook. Then, okay. So you opened a restaurant and you're like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, That's okay. what happened. All right. Well, you need to stretch that I'll out. Stretch it out. A bit. So uh Lula is uh Lula actually is a was a cafe before I owned it. Uh it uh was the very first place I ever went to when I moved to Chicago. Um and it, I, it was a beloved local neighborhood cafe, 90s. 
um, cafe, you know, everybody was smoking those days and uh, there were a lot of espresso drinks and music playing and uh, I fell in love with this cafe and um, that is where I met my wife and the cafe eventually was, um, you know, sort of uh, went through some hard times and we took it over. So we all, all we had to do is just they were they gave us the keys and said all right you deal with this and uh, so uh, we you know painted it and uh, and put some art up and then we opened the doors and at that time I had been cooking in restaurants just as a way to make money so I didn't have any skill set at all um, so I did um, very quickly need to learn how to cook at the same time I was given a lot of space it was still a cafe. Now it's a restaurant and much more serious of a, uh, you know, of a culinary environment. But at the time, you know, it was pretty casual and we were able to learn organically through cookbooks uh, and uh, trial and error, uh, lots of error. And then uh, we eventually, you know, really learned what we were doing. I think at the same time, that's a good way to learn because you're not, you know, there's no program, there's no uh, dogma, you're just sort of guessing and figuring things out. So you, you, you were building the plane as you were flying. Exactly. Okay, yeah. oh, that, that's amazing. Yeah. Now, so I, I'm really curious. So someone who has a limited cooking background and takes over a cafe and then realizes that they need to have a menu, what was on the menu back then? Um, well, it was a 90s cafe. I, I don't know if you remember this kind of food, but there was stuffed portobello mushrooms and oh, uh, okay. like fusion-y quesadillas, you know, with uh, mango salsa and those kinds of things. It was very 90s, you know, oh, okay. fusion vibes. Yeah, and you and yeah. you could pull that off. We, we, we pulled it off well. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Awesome. Um, one, one of the things that, that I, I find remarkable about the, the cafe itself Everything, the cafe, because there's a cafe and then there's a food program. And if you walk into the cafe, the cafe is super casual. Yeah. It's really super casual, super comfortable. Then you read the menu and you realize that you're 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 in for something, you know, because it reads mm -hmm. really well. And then the plates arrive and you almost feel like you could be in a whole nother place. Mm -hmm. I mean, really. Yeah. I mean, some some of the plates that Jason puts out at it. Pretty astonishing, right? And but you're in this environment that just keeps you super, super Rounded. comfortable. Yeah. Was, was that is that like intentional designer did it well, I mean, through the journey? You know, we started very casually and then the food got very serious. Um, but you can never take yourself too seriously in that environment. So <laughs> exactly. I, you know, so uh you, you do have to have some kind of humility in there, um, just because of the space. Uh, and also because breakfast, lunch, and dinner immediately makes it um, less formal. Mm -hmm. So even though at dinner, you know, some of the food is quite formal and, and you know, crafted with intention and a lot of intention towards what it looks like. Uh, but at the same time, it's still a casual place. And what's great about that is that we have a really diverse group of people who come. So people can come on, you know, important nights for themselves, you know, birthdays, anniversaries, or but there's a lot of first dates, there's a lot of families, a lot of, age, you know, diversity of age, like some young and older people are coming. So that kind of like casualness um, mixed with the seriousness of food really allows you to kind of treat it how you want to treat it uh, as a guest, which is what a cafe is supposed to be. In but it's, it, it, in many ways, it's also very much a neighborhood joint. Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, so you you have neighbor. to have you have to have your tranche of regular. Mm -hmm. So and we do that by keeping. There's a handful of dishes that we did in the first few years that we keep on the menu all the time, and then the rest of the menu, eighty percent of the menu changes constantly, and we don't repeat dishes. So you know we've been open for twenty four years, and you know every week is a new dish or two. So um, that's thousands of dishes, you know, uh, that we we've, we've done. But there's a core little group that we call the cafe menu that doesn't change. So if you want to be a neighborhood restaurant, you want that expectation. And, that you'll all be always be able to find your favorite thing. Um, so we do have that. You know, um, there's a pasta that my wife's grandmother used to make. We have a version of that. It's always on the menu. That, that's awesome. We yeah. had that the very last yeah. time I was there. Yeah. Tell us about that. Um, that's a bucatini dish with brown butter and feta yeah. and yeah. cinnamon. Um, and it's uh kind of a it's a Greek inspired dish, not where it's Greek and um, but it has, you know, it's a mix, it's very simple, but it's a mix of like technique you have to do. Brown butter is easy to make a mistake with brown butter because once you go too far, too far is 
you know, <laughs> it's, it's not good. It's not good. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's not butter burning. Uh, right. So you need to be hot technique with this fish, but at the same time, it's very simple. And then the, um, the flavor of the cinnamon is sort of an outside choice, and uh, people get surprised by it. They don't expect to see cinnamon and salty, you know, savory food. Um, so I think that's kind of what we're always looking for, that it's surprise and like that, you know, something that just brings your senses alive. Now, there, there, uh, many of the dishes that you chose for the book were chosen for particular points in time. Mm -hmm. Tell me the reasoning behind that. Is it so that people could get a sense of the journey done? Yeah, I, I, uh, care uh, the book all has dates stamped on it. At the restaurant every day, we stamp the, the, um, the menus with a banker stamp, which this crowd, maybe my son won't know what that is, but a banker stamp is like, you know, the, the date stamp. We do that every day. We stamp it. So, um, I mean, the idea is that uh, we're a highly seasonal restaurant. You know, uh, seasons in Chicago are extremely short. You might get asparagus for, you know, a, three weeks or something. So uh, we like to say, like, this is happening right now. You're here with us enjoying it. This is the only now you're going to get. Um, enjoy it while you have it, and then, you know, it's gone, and remember it. So with recipes, one of the things in the book that I say and I try to talk about when we're cooking is, I, I don't believe that recipes necessarily need to make the same thing every time. Recipes are about the experience, about um, the trial, and then about your own ability to change them so that um, you have the, I don't know, uh, just the, the freedom to explore and to cook, mm -hmm. rather than just to follow um you know to follow the steps just you know mindlessly and uh uh those of you who i have a, a great percentage of people here know my mother so know that that really bothers her the idea that you won't follow a recipe like step, <laughs> step, step, step. Um, so she gets really mad when i say this but like i like the idea of like the recipes don't get repeated you just you know we're sort of like you know we try something out and then you might do something different so well, here, like, i'm saying like mix and match like just you know go with the flow a little bit well it's like pirates of the caribbean with uh with with johnny depp uh, the code it's really more of a guideline yeah right? <laughs> it's not it's not a code um it it, it it's it, it's funny uh because you've had now so 24 years 24 yeah and your your gm's been with you almost the entire there been there a long time so. yeah uh, i mean like 20 plus years um what what's it like i mean you know we went through covid you know all of this documents and i just heard you know i was in help for you know, with, with Rick and mm -hmm. he was telling me about his challenges and stuff like that. What did that do for you guys when it comes to like turnover? It was, you know, it, I know she's a long term. You have a couple of other we have several people that are like that. I, I mean, before the pandemic, uh, you know, I have a hundred employees roughly. Right? I would say, you know, seventy five of those people had been there for over ten years, um, and it. It was one of those things like when the pandemic happened, um, you know, you lost all that um, uh, immediately in a, in a heartbeat. And um, the thing I think that I, I say in the book, and I've said a bunch of times uh, talking about it, is the thing that I think restaurateurs fear a lot is that, you know, it's a very fickle business and you never know um, what's going to happen. And you you fear the idea. The, the thought that like, oh, you know, people are going to stop coming or like a, a restaurant will close. I mean, I don't know what the statistic is, but, you know, one out of two restaurants close in the first five years of the Anyway. Open. Anyways. <laughs> um, so you're always concerned that you're not going to make it. Um, and then the pandemic basically made sure that nobody made it for that brief period. And then you're like, oh, God, what am I going to do? So some people came back and some people went on to other things. And the, that's kind of a beautiful part of the community. You know, I, I have a food runner who was with me for seven years, and he always used to be a, he was a Thai kickboxer. Wow. And he did that on the side. He was a young guy, and he just threw himself into this role. And now he has a school, and he's teaching young people, and he's doing, so some people got a chance to, like, really live their dreams. Um, and um, and others realized that they love restaurants, and they came back. So it was a, it was a mix and match. Okay, interesting. Um, at the same time, uh, it did also give me a chance to like actually write a book. Um, yeah, because that was th this had. I, I'm thinking it was like, written the whole published thing, date is like yeah, now. Yeah. This this was happening then. Then yeah. So I was literally, uh, you know, we had the restaurant was closed. We had the tables with the to go boxes and the little window where people were coming up. 
Um, and I was downstairs, you know, on a folding table trying to put together the recipes for the book during that time. But so, so the, the photography is beautiful. I mean, it's like really awesome. And those are the plates yeah. that arrive to you when you're in the restaurant eating. That's what comes to you. That you did that at the restaurant? No, I, yeah, no, actually. So the I wrote the book in the restaurant. And then when we when we set out to make the book, uh, and fight is the publisher, they do an amazing job um, with the uh, with the design and the and the, the paper and the printing. But the photographer was a friend of a friend, which is very community. You know, Lula's a community of artists. It's very I got I mean, like, who's got yeah, who's got to know somebody. Uh, and uh, I was just telling the story a few minutes ago. But when we first started the cookbook, we hired a stylist, a a plateware person. There was someone with fabric. She was ironing all these fabrics, and another person with a collection of uh, you know antique spoons. It's and we went, you know, we went to a photography studio and we took photos of twelve dishes. And I got them back, and I was like, "This is all completely wrong." Um, it didn't feel like the restaurant. It didn't feel like me. It felt like a I don't know crate and barrel catalog. So I just nothing against that. But I, I forget this. And uh, so we actually uh, scrapped the whole photo studio idea. Uh, we got rid of the stylist and the photographer and I just at my house. Um, just at your house? At my house. Just set up shop. And uh, we we just took photos in the house. And there's just very simple colored backdrops. And we all the plates are, almost all the plates are white. And, you know, there's no fork or you know there's nothing else in them besides the food and the, the thing that I, I realized is that my restaurant is really particular it's an unusual spot uh has a long history and for me it was more about the writing and the the storytelling than it was about trying to pretend that this table that I was taking a picture of was in the restaurant I didn't want to fake that so we just took pictures of the food that's awesome. Yeah, it was good. It came out good. Well, it's stunning because I find, and then who did like, like when it, like the choice of like the graphics and the font and size of the book? Yeah, a designer actually that I've, I've never actually been in the same room. Um, she's based in London. And the way the fight in company works is that they work with you to choose someone. And then a lot of the graphical, the graphic elements, the big letters and that's taken a, a lot of it's taken from the what the restaurant looks like and yeah. the kind of graphics that we've done. So she's restaurant. like from London and she picked that up because yeah. Jacques and I were talking earlier when we were like going through the book and I'm like, it's kind of cool because everything else about the book is like the cafe, but then the plates are like really clean and good looking. Like, yeah. It's like the cafe. So was she ever in Lula? Or no, she's never. She never. So you sent her like menus, and she. Oh yeah, that I mean up. pictures and menus, and she okay. picked it up, which which is great. So it has a yeah. it has a real artistic vibe to it, and she she got it immediately. That's great, yeah. and she still hasn't she's been to the restaurant. She's never been as far as I know. Now, <laughs> you yeah. got a remedy. I, got, I, I mean, maybe she'll come she, nailed yeah, she, <laughs> she nailed it. Yeah, she nailed it. She nailed it. Yeah, she nailed it. Now it it, it 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 it's interesting because a lot a lot of people just assume um you know that when you're executing at a level like like you guys execute at, at Lula because the service really matches the mixology the the the, the wine program you know everything about it. it 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 just it's this beautiful cross between super high execution and genuine hospitality of just wanting everybody that's eating there to be to be comfortable mm -hmm. right um and you pull that off as a creative, as a writer. Your wife is a creative also. Mm -hmm. and what what has this all? I mean, how how is this stuff? Because you guys started the cafe. Did she work it? Oh, or yeah. Was, she was, or was she just like cafe. like playing guitar yeah, on the uh, corner? She was literally she pushed out for years um, until we. Uh, oh, so you both cooked. Family. We both cooked in the beginning. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and you know, she has a golden palate. She's very uh, very astute in that respect. But it's a. This place is an artistic community. There are a lot of uh, artists in our neighborhood. Um, and, you know, our neighborhood in Chicago is, I mean, maybe to use a, it's kind of like about the Brooklyn of Chicago. So there's a lot of young artists and a lot of people making and doing things. So that's our community. And uh, we came up in that, you know, I wanted to be a writer. I was working there and 
and trying to, you know, try to uh, write a novel and she was a musician, she's got records out. I mean, everybody is making things, you know? Yeah. Um, so the, the cafe just became like another place where all these people would, like, would meet and go together. So, so in, in that portion, it was a family affair. So Cass is here, where's Cass? Where's Cass? Hey, Cass. Do you work in a restaurant now? No, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> Look at where you shake his head. Yeah, I, I don't know about you guys, but that's pretty definitive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I said I say in the book, restaurant kids have a, you know, restaurant kids have a, um, you know, I mean, like they know it's a twenty four seven job. You know? uh, my kids are like, yeah. I'm never ever <laughs> ever going to be in the restaurant business, and and I end up with like one of them. You know, in the yeah, yeah, trying to go into the business and everything like that. But it's it's it, it it's interesting because um, I think how old were you when I was twenty seven? Oh, tw oh, when yeah. this opened? Oh yeah, late late start. I guess so. you're late bloomer. I know, but, but oh, I dude, mean, thanks. <laughs> oh my god, that, yeah, that's I mean, amazing. Twenty seven. So I mean, well, it, it, chefing is uh, you know definitely uh, typically a young person's game. Um, but I don't, I don't yeah, but it's, it, it's also intuitive and it, it requires that creative piece. Mm -hmm. So there's, um, well, often I'll, you know, tell folks it's, it, it's, if it's baked into your DNA, if it's in your blood, you know, if it's really deeply a part of you, you can do it naturally. You know, I think of, you know, Stradivarius likely, you know, was one of the greatest improvisers of all time, but it took a formal lesson, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, or you could be a multimillionaire and love the piano and spend an incredible small fortune on lessons. And yes, you will be able to play a song from beginning to end. You'll be able to execute the recipe, but it's not something that might ever yeah. inspire or get. I mean, like, like looking back, I see, and, you know, how central food it was like growing up to my family and the culture of the people that I, that I knew. And like, you know, high and low. I mean, it was uh it's a big mix, but uh but you know, a lot of a lot of dinners at my grandparents' house. Mm -hmm. Um, and my grandparents actually owned a restaurant um that they started in their 50s, you know, um, a small diner in Cheshire. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, I remember being a little kid and sitting on the stool and spinning around. <laughs> um, and I mean my grandparents were obviously great cooks and, and everyone in my family. Cooks. We spent, I mean, food was really central growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think everybody has that. You know, so I, I, mean, I didn't notice at the time, you know, how important it was. But, um, you know, looking back, it makes sense. That, you know, even though I, it wasn't intentional. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Is that true for you, too? It, it, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I, my grandparents had a farm in Moreland, Missouri, and I used to go down there every summer. Mm -hmm. We were basically the migrant farm workers. When I did, <laughs> I mean, they, they couldn't afford farm workers anymore. So yeah. my mom was one of 13. So there were like 30 grandkids that were like the free labor for, mm -hmm. you know, six or eight weeks. Right. right, right, right. Um, how to butcher, how to cook, how to, how to, how to pickle and can mm -hmm. and cure and ferment and stuff like that. It just I just thought it was normal. But there were some of us who really caught on and loved it and were good at it. There were others that were like, just let me drive the tractor. <laughs> just let me stuff some some burlap bags full of sweet corn and I'll be fine. But don't please don't ask me to cook anything. Um, but I think um, uh, there's a question that I want to oh yeah. Um, so we it's it it's also this a genuine hospitality thing because it's being able to cook mm -hmm. right and you also have to have a love yeah. and and also a desire to please people yeah. but then the whole service aspect is a whole nother thing because yes yeah. it's, it's one thing to be able to put out a really great plate but to have that plate delivered in a way that expectations are met or exceeded and people just feel really comfortable with the experiences yeah is that is that something that you and your wife just pulled off on your own, or did you bring I mean, somebody in? To no, we didn't bring anybody that in. Part of him. I think that's not that's. Or was it a curiosity? So you studied up on it. I I, I think it's mostly treating people well because I mean the whole idea of if as owners and chefs, if we treat the people who are working for us with respect and care, then they'll give the respect and care to the guests. Um, I you know for the most part, um, and I think. Um, that's something that we focused really hard on over the years um, is creating a environment where people felt 
happy to be at work. Yeah. Not necessarily always the case at um at a restaurant. Um, you know, to be honest, but our you know our team is has had joy being together and really want to express like the pride that they have in being on this team. So I think that's what you feel. Um, it takes a lot more work. Um, I mean, I'm there a lot. Um, my wife is there, you know, uh, and it it means like listening to, I mean, you have to be a therapist to a hundred people <laughs> regularly uh, and, you know, talk to people who are, you know, it's mostly young people. Jason, my daughter stuff. married a vegan. What do I yeah, do? Yeah, just, <laughs> 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 literally just was spent the, the morning texting one of my sous chef who had you know put an animal down it was a first i mean they're young i mean i'm you know they're young kids they're 20 22 they never had to do anything like this before they don't know what to do and that they're going through something so you could either just be like get to work and you know you know, I want to say there are no. some who are like that, or you can say like, okay, I've been through this too. This is what you got to do. And like, try to listen to them for a little while. I feel like if you do that, it's more work, but ultimately you're going to get more respect yeah, and, uh, uh, and, and greater reward. So, you know, you choose, you know, the easy way or the, the long, um, and <laughs> positives and negatives from both sides, but I think it's better this way. I agree. If you don't mind, talk a little bit about how it works. Sure. And, and, you know, where it came from and yeah what really motivated you is it this is how this is really how the we know each other best um but um 12 years ago um in during the obama administration michelle started a garden which probably a lot of people remember uh and when michelle started the garden she had this uh program asking chefs to come to the garden learn about the garden and then take the message out to the schools in the country um, and there were a group of us that got invited to go into schools. Um, and when that happened, um, uh, the four or five of us chefs in Chicago who went uh, went into this school school system. And what we did was uh, instead of just walking into the classroom and being like, "Okay, this is how you cook," what we did is we asked the teachers uh, in the room, like, "What are you guys having a hard time teaching right now? Like, what's on the agenda?" for you to teach on the day that we're going to be there, um, which was, I don't know how we got this idea, but it just came to us and it happened. It was, a, you know, maybe a lucky moment. Um, and, you know, in that day we got everything from, well, well I'm teaching about magnets and the science class to American revolution and this other class to little kids were, were you know, learning about similes and, you know, the difference between like and, uh, you know, in, in language and in, uh, in the language arts class. So we, ha we had seven chefs, we took over seven classrooms, and like I did the American Revolution, this other guy did, you know, similes, and we all used food to do that class. So um, every classroom was different, and we used food to help the teacher teach the subject that they were supposed to teach that day. Um, and now today, this program became a, it became a training program for teachers. So teachers apply to work with us. Um, across the country now, um, and uh, they are paid to do this. It's like a professional development, uh, uh, you know, part of their career movement, and they can get uh, credits for this as well. But what we do is we we teach them to use food Hi. to teach in their classroom. And the great thing about that is it's um, it definitely breaks barriers between kids and class classrooms. I mean, especially in Chicago, you see a lot of barriers between uh, for just between kids from different identities or different uh, you know, academic abilities that don't really talk to each other. Uh, they're in their little pockets in the classroom. And if you uh, are teaching them about, you know, uh, writing and poetry and, you know, language, and they're stuck there with their blank paper, they're not going to get anywhere. But if you bring in a box of vegetables and you're like, okay, we're going to write poems about tomatoes, all of a sudden it's fun. They're, you know, uh, using <laughs> language in a different way, and you find the kids that don't normally talk to each other talking to each other. So um, that's what Pilot does uh, in a very, you know, simple way. And then we also have a whole bunch of other partnerships. Like one that we're excited about is with the USDA right now. Um, so we created lessons around fruits and vegetables, and then the USDA is bringing fruits and vegetables into kids that are disadvantaged all over the country. And not only do they get the food to eat it, which is what you know they obviously need to eat, um, and because a lot of these kids are food insecure, but then they're also getting some kind of like fun lesson 
um, about the food so it engages them more. Right. Um, and this is how they start their day. Yeah, so, so it can be, become a part of their life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's and awesome. they can bring that home to their parents, which is another, you know, part of it that we see a lot of success with. Give Jason a hand. Oh, with yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, we, we want to leave a little bit of time for uh, Q&A, and then I guess this fine young man, you know how to write, right? Anybody have anything that they would like to ask the chef? Yeah, what did you call your restaurant? Was it called Luma or did you change the name? I changed the name. It was, uh, a funny story is that the place where, uh, I'll tell this story quickly, but uh, when I moved to Chicago, I went to Illinois to study creative writing. Um, and uh, I went and to Illinois State University to study with David Foster Wallace, who was there in the 90s uh, before he became really famous. Um, so I studied with David for two years in, in normal Illinois, and I moved up to Chicago, and I had heard about this cafe in this neighborhood, so I went to, it was called Logan Beach. It was called Logan Beach because there was a cigar shop next to it. It was a Cuban neighborhood uh, in the 50s, I guess, 50s, 60s. A lot of Cubans still left in the neighborhood, and there was a cigar shop next to us, and the Cuban guys would show up on Saturday and Sunday morning. And they put like chaise lounges out on the sidewalk and they sit back with like the, you know, reflector, like Polly Walnuts. <laughs> and they had, like, they had the coconut oil and the cigars. And so when this woman uh, opened up her cafe, coffee shop, she called it Logan Beach because it was, it looked like a beach. So all these guys sunbathing <laughs> on the sidewalk in the middle of, you know, downtown Chicago. Um, so that was uh, the name of the place. The interesting story is that, so I moved to uh, Chicago with a, a woman named Leah, and uh, it was a girlfriend that I had uh, in uh, grad school. And I went to the Logan Beach Cafe on the first day that I was there. And we sat down at the table in the window and there was a chalkboard menu and it said, Leah's amazing soup. And so I turned to my girlfriend, I'm like, look, there's another Leah. And, uh, spells her name just like you. There was no H. And so in that moment, I was sitting in what was to become my restaurant, talking to my soon-to-be ex-girlfriend about my future wife. <laughs> Amazing, right? That was, that was, you can't make that stuff up. <laughs> that was day one. So that's how, uh, so then I started hanging out at that cafe um, and I met Leah Childs, my wife. She was a she was a manager and uh, at that cafe, and when it when it fell when that cafe fell apart, that's when the two of us decided to take it over. Um, so yeah, we and like I said, we didn't have any money or anything. We just uh, you know it, the space was there. There was no no equipment. There was a home stove, a home refrigerator, and an espresso machine. And that was it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. And it was a it's now three times as big as it was that. There, there was a uh, show on TV that was in Chicago about the restaurant. Yeah. Talking about the bear. It, I think. Bear. Yes. Have you okay. seen it? Yes. <laughs> and, and, and every time my wife and I used to watch it, I said, wow, Jason's in Chicago. I wonder how real it is. I think it's very close to it. So really? I do. I mean, it's as close as they come. I think it's as close as it gets. Wow. Um, so uh, I'm very close to the people who made that show. Uh, there's it's a brother and sister. The brother is the producer, director, writer. The sister is a chef. They grew up in Chicago. They're my friends. Um, and in fact, uh, I did an event just like this in LA and she was my co-host. Wow. Um, and so she's the one that really brought the realism to it. And to show you how real it was, Mother's Day 2020, um, the restaurant, my restaurant was closed for indoor dining, it was the pandemic. Um, we, uh, we were serving to go food and we were busy. It was me and two other people. Nah, that was it. I mean, or maybe maybe one other, or three or four people running the restaurant, and we turned on the uh, the uh, ordering device, and literally <laughs> 150 <laughs> orders spat out from that morning. 
like the first, you know, nine o'clock, boom. So at nine o'clock immediately, 902, I was an hour and a half behind. Um, and it just kept coming. And it was, you know, a due to like a sort of a technological error. Like we had limited the number of orders, but people, they, it, somehow the limit was not kept. They just, it was insane. There was a line out the door and we had to go out on the street and it was just like that situation where yeah, as, as we watch that we, i used to always oh, tell oh, them, no. one day i'm going to ask yeah how, how real this is this it's, it's very real <laughs> it's very real i mean they make they take some liberties but yeah. uh you well, know, it's television. yeah <laughs> i mean we have a piece of seven fishes in my household we talk about that, but we don't there was nobody was yelling at each other like that <laughs> i was a little obsessed again <laughs> No, it's a, I, yeah, I, and uh, I'll speak to it too because for me, um, there have been some disappointments. You know, there are a lot of reality cooking shows. Um, you know, uh, you know, with the the competitions and people yelling, and the, I'm just like, oh man, it's that that's that's not it. Yeah, that that doesn't, and and it actually gets frustrating because you know we we fear because. You know, Jason and I, there, those of us um, who really care about the reputation of our industry. And it just doesn't do us a service, you know, honestly. I mean, I think it gets people maybe more interested in food than they would be if they weren't being so entertained. But then, it, you know, Bradley Cooper came out with Burn. Oh, yeah, was... And I was so disappointed because it was just so over way too many liberties, right? So, you know, when the bear came out, I was really reluctant, but I, I spent because I had I worked in Chicago back in the late seventies, early eighties, and you know there a, a lot of the craziness in the kitchen, especially once you know American chefs who made it through to become a chef really started imposing their personality and their drive on other people. It, it could be really brutal and violence, you know. And, uh, you know, so, but, but I, I also think, uh, for me, but so you and your wife went on our own from my perspective, uh, it, it really caused me to say, I want to be a chef someday because I want to <laughs> you don't have to be this way <laughs> to put out a decent plate of food, right? Yeah, yeah I can't, see, can't wait yeah. to see what they do on the third season. So yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. I mean, I, I think they're putting a lot of care into it. They put a lot of care into it. And yeah. tons of my friends have been, uh, you know, on my own. Former pastry chef made the chocolate, you know, the chocolate cake, and then yeah, yeah. he made that chocolate cake. Um, a lot of those people. So uh, it's been he good. Made the chocolate cake. He, my my pastry chef is the one that made that wow. chocolate cake and on the show. That you know, she's yeah. now works for them. Um, so uh, it's good, and I, that you know, I do a lot of expediting, and uh, which is you know, calling the orders to the team out loud. Mm -hmm. You know, we might serve six hundred people. It's a lot of calling and organizing and tickets and firing and all that kind of stuff a lot of time. And you that really showed the stress of that and that latter part of the season. And and the way that that uh that cousin of his like takes it on and then starts to organize it and the kind of excitement that you get and the pride you get in organizing that chaos into getting to the end of it. And I felt like, felt like I was seeing that yeah. that that's that section. Awesome. Another question. Yeah. For, for your cookbook. Was the writing portion was it more of a challenge than you expected? Was it fairly straightforward? Or uh, I mean, this is what I wanted to do. So I, I you know, I wrote a lot of uh, chefs hired people to write books, and, but I, I mean, I, I was studying to be a writer before this, so I wrote the book, and I was very serious about it. It has a very long introduction. Excuse me, very long introduction. Um. And uh, there's this book that I love, the Zuni Cafe cookbook. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're familiar with it's a really beautiful cookbook. Um, uh, this chef Judy Rogers, who passed away not you know maybe five seven years ago, uh, but she has a beautiful long introduction. And I kept thinking about that's what I want. I want to tell a story of like how I got there, what the restaurant is, uh, and they were gracious enough to give me like a big chunk of space in the beginning of the book spent a lot of time working on that um and uh and thinking about like what how it sat the word sounded and i wanted it to be as important to me as the recipes were awesome other questions or should we go ahead yeah, no, no go for it yeah so you wrote this yeah still in the chef at that point oh yeah yeah 
Um, you know, honestly, the pandemic, um, you know, we we were uh, open less. Um, you know, mm-hmm. 20, 2020 was crazy. I was spending a lot of time advocating for restaurants and doing that kind of stuff. But when we when we started doing the to go food, um, it was a you know four day a week versus a seven day a week thing. Um, but that's not really like. I still was working constantly. I don't know. I I work a lot, and you know, you can find time if you if you organize yourself in the right way. So well, they they say if you ever want to get something done, give it to a really good yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Also, sign a contract. In <laughs> <laughs> someone's way, more yeah. to come. Yes, it was difficult during the pandemic. Is that- mm-hmm. With the restaurant, you're yeah. worried about financial problems and so forth. And I'm sure, I well. yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, the truth is, without the two forms mm-hmm. of federal financial assistance yeah. that came through, without PPP and um, the Restaurants Act, we would have, we would have been close for sure. Uh, I mean, maybe we may, might have made a comeback, but those two pieces of legislation allowed people to stay open. I mean, that's the reality of it. There's no way I had, you know, uh, this, it, restaurants are at such a thin margin to begin with, you know, 5% of, uh, yeah, is, right. a, is a maximum for restaurants and they're 5% to 10 profit. That's, that's it. it. That's it. Yeah. yeah. That's the tr- traditional way. And it's, a, it's, a, if you can do three and a half consistently, you've got, Potential for a legacy restaurant. Yeah, you, you beat the odds. So it's a slim margin, and it's also uh, nobody has. I mean, it's not like you have the payroll for you know six months in the bank account, and people are just. Li- I mean, small restaurants are are family businesses because people live off of them. You know, they you know they they work there and then they pay for the last two weeks, and then if they're you know a bill comes up, they'll pay it. They, they don't. It's not. There's no bud. You know five-year budgets or even annual budgets for most restaurants. So uh, when when the um, the flow stopped, a lot of people were, had no idea how they were going to pay rent. And, you know, you needed grace, you needed grace from your landlords. And then, you know, honestly, like uh, uh, most people were really behind us. And, uh, you know, people supported us with to-go stuff and gift cards and things like that. So, you know, we got through it, but it was not, it was not all. Did you write the book and then go looking for a publisher, or did a publisher come to you? No, I got lucky. Um, so Fiden is a, um, you know, a well-respected publisher, and to be honest, they don't. I, I haven't seen a Fiden book that's a, about a casual restaurant before. So they usually do three-star Michelin restaurants, and, you yeah. know, Nola, yeah. and those kind of places. Yeah. Um, so my story is that uh, I had a friend who had a cookbook, another chef, uh, Jeremy Fox, who had wow. a cookbook with them. Um, and Jeremy came to the restaurant and said, "Oh, you know, you want to do a cookbook? Let me let me tell you about this. You know, I they, they made an introduction. And uh, but the the funny story was that nothing really came of that. But then uh, a few weeks mm. later, this really mm. uh, 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 famous Swedish chef. Um, uh, who had a restaurant called Fabikin, which is a, a you know three star Michelin like fine dining place. You have to travel, you know, uh, very far to get to. He showed up at Lula, one day. and I'm the only one who's gonna know who this guy is. I mean, he's uh, so I, you know, I was a fan. I freaked out. I ran up to him. I can't believe you're here. I'm so excited. And he's also published by Python. And so he had a great meal, and he happened to be dining with the. Uh, publisher in chief of you know the head of Biden wow. that day. So I had two recommendations within a period of month and they called me up. So that uh, awesome. was very lucky. It was very fortuitous. I mean, restaurants, you know, don't necessarily cookbooks for restaurants aren't as much of a thing as they used to be. So I got lucky. You were looking for a publisher? No, I they called me. They were like, hey, would you no, no. no. Yeah, they so they what they do, they yeah. called me up and said, Would you like to do this? And I said yes, and then you write a proposal and they accept it. And then you know, literally almost three, two and a half years later. So I'm sure out. he knew he wanted to write a cookbook. Yeah. yeah. But so, yeah. he had other things to do. <laughs> until <laughs> until somebody yeah. reached out. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Already in the picture. COVID, uh, yeah. I think I signed the contract in uh, uh, June of 2020. 
So it's yeah, oh, wow. I'm writing the thing of COVID. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, I remember not hearing from them for a little while and freaking out and turned out she had COVID. It's like, <laughs> it's all the time. like oh, I've been out for three months, you know. <laughs> so all right. Well, you you ready to sign some? Yeah, good. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. <laughs>